I waited patiently for God, who turned to me and heard my cry. We sing a new song. Our mouths are full of the grace of God. Blessed are we when we make our trust in the Lord. We sing along with our many wonders, O oh God. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire. So we sing, here I am. Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to Lake Fenton United Methodist Church. For those of you who don't remember me, my name is Pastor Vincent Slocum. I am so glad to be back here with, with all of you. Good morning to all of our friends joining us online through Facebook and YouTube. God is with you just as surely as God is here with us in this place. My friends, I have missed you. Did you guys miss me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay, good. That's the correct answer. <laughs> This morning, we are continuing our, our sermon series, Glimpses of the Kingdom. It's a, little, it's a little different. So in our Bibles, we hear frequent references to this place called the Kingdom of God. But, but one of the funny things about the Kingdom of God is that it's entirely upside down from anything we would think kingdoms 
were in, in this world, right? In, in place of power and strength, there is love. In place of authority and control, there is, there is family. There is kin. And, and so actually, more appropriately, we might, we might call the kingdom of God a kingdom of God, a place where all people are family. And, and for the next couple of weeks. We're going to be sharing stories from our Bible and, and lessons that give us small glimpses of what that, that kingdom, what that kingdom looks like in practice. I'm so excited to be back here with all of you sharing that journey. So now as we prepare to begin our service, I invite you all to pause for a minute. I've been pausing for the last two weeks now, but but I'm going to pause for just a minute, just a minute longer, and I invite you all to join me. Take a deep breath. Close your eyes. As we begin our worship, breathe in the presence of God. Take him into your lungs. Feel God's Holy Spirit moving through your body. Breathe out the worries, the stress, the cares that have been keeping you from feeling the presence of God. This morning, breathe in his presence, which is given freely to you, and breathe out everything else. Allow yourself to simply feel God's presence this morning. Be present with him and be present with us. For the next hour, as we share together in this time of worship, I invite you to continue to breathe deeply of God's presence. Continue to be present with him and, and with all of us as we share together in this, in this time of worship. All right, so now by my calendar, you all are two weeks overdue for, for some pastor hugs. So, so let's, let's do things right this week. And, and please, once again, turn and, and make friendly, non-threatening eye contact with someone seated near you as we greet one another and exchange God's peace this morning. Continue to make friendly, non-threatening eye contact as you all repeat after me. I am glad, I am glad. you are here. You are here. God, loves you. God loves you. And I love you too. And I love you too. See? I switched things up for you. What happens when you let me leave? Please stand and greet one another with a sign of God's peace this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That guy's kissing me. What's that? Good morning. Somebody you better go out there and get one. No. Oh, yeah. I have a call. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What's that? We miss you. Oh, How about you guys got Brian and Karen? It was good. It was yeah. all good, really. Oh, right. We yeah. still miss you. I was good. He was good. Oh, he's, good. he's good. I like, I like Brian. Him. Yeah, he's, he's good.
brings us great joy to place these gifts at your altar. May they be for us a source of your abundance as we seek to be followers of your Son and builders of your kingdom right here in the Lake Fenton. And now, as we prepare to come together in, in a time of prayer, I'd like to once again ask if, if anyone has any joys or concerns that they would like to share with us this morning, anything for which we, as a congregation, can, can be in prayer together this, this week. Another spark. I don't need a mic. Okay. Another big shooting last night. Shooting in California. Ten people. Yeah. Is it ten people yeah. now? I saw I saw nine in the last news report. When okay. I know those those I numbers wish you could changed. Do something about it. You're a preacher. I know. You know, we I, we we keep praying and praying and, and writing letters, but yeah. Oh, our, I just want to continue prayers for Gary and Karen Morris. Continue yeah. prayers for Gary and, and Karen Morris and Gary, who's who suffered a fall and and uh, is, is still under care. Continued prayers for them that Gary recover. Yeah. Well, prayers for my friend Tammy, who was recently diagnosed with colon cancer. Prayers for Tammy, recently diagnosed with, with colon cancer and preparing to undergo treatment. Yes, Margaret. Uh, went to a surprise 90th birthday party yesterday, so I'd like us all to pray for those who have long and very healthy lives. <laughs> also, please pray for those who are traveling this day. My nephew had a glitch and he's trying to get back to Florida. And please be with all those who are suffering with all this bad weather and connections and all that good stuff. Prayers for all those traveling and slick and constantly changing weather, that they arrive in their, in their destination safe. And, and prayers also for those who celebrate the joy of, of long lives and, and new birthdays, and, but, but also prayers in, in the ways that those uh, mean, mean saying goodbye as, as well. Yes? We need to pray for a nice, good rummage sale. Prayers for a nice rummage sale, a generous yeah. rummage sale, where you can obtain sweaters like yeah. this. <laughs> Doing my part. This is promotional. <laughs> Prayers that Pastor gets a new sweater. And prayers that, that the community comes out and, and is generous and People find the treasures and curios that, that they're, they're looking for, that these, these items find a good home, and, and that people are generous with us when they take them. My friends, whatever is on your heart this week, whatever joys or concerns have been with you, whether they're joys or concerns that you've shared with us, this morning, or, or joys and concerns that, that you've kept to yourself. In just a moment, we will, we will share a quiet moment of silence together, during which time I invite you to offer whatever prayers you, you like and whatever words you choose in your own heart as, as we all prepare ourselves in our hearts to come together as a congregation in prayer to God this morning.
God most holy, infinite, and wise. God, you see all and know all. And even as you see and know all, you have seen and know the cares and the joys of our hearts. Whether we have named them to you this morning or not. Or this morning in, in prayer, we, we remember Tammy. Who's struggling with colon cancer. <clears throat> whose life knows a new fear. A new doubt. A new uncertainty. Lord, in this difficult time, we ask that you be her strength. May your healing be upon her. That the doctors might be swift thorough in their care for her. Lord, we remember all those who are traveling this, <coughs> this week, who are making their way home amidst snow and ice, changing weather conditions. That they find their way home safe, that you be with them on the journey, that you be with them on the destination, at the destination, just as we know you are always with us. The Lord especially, we remember all those lives lost in yet another senseless shooting. Lord, as the numbers grow, and as news of more and more shootings reach us, our hearts grieve just as our tongues cry out for you. Help us to see a way out of this darkness. Help us, as followers of your Son, Jesus Christ, to find a better way and to show that way to the world around us. That love and compassion win where fear and where terror have seemed so strong. Lord, we pray for all those lives lost, that they be, that they be received into your care. And that your Holy Spirit be poured out on the families who are grieving their loss now. Lord, for all these things, we pray to you this morning in the words that your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. At this time, I'd like to invite Linda Z to come up and share our scripture reading this morning from, from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. For those of you following along at home or in your pew Bibles, our reading for this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. Again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be knit together in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been made clear to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? 
I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Deus, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. According to the legends that the Roman people told to each other, the city of Rome was founded by a man named Romulus. As the story goes, Romulus's mother was a virgin. She was a priestess of the Roman goddess Vesta, named Re Silvia. One day, despite her virginity, Re Silvia becomes miraculously pregnant by the Roman god of war, Mars. And she gave birth to twin sons, Romulus and his twin brother, Remus. The king at that time, a man by the name of Julius, became threatened by the possibility that Ray Silvia's two sons, the sons of God, would grow up to be powerful and strong, that they would be a threat to Amulius and his children, so he ordered the infant boys to be executed. They were taken out into the woods and left alone to die of exposure, but, but of course, the fates had ordained a greater destiny for these two boys, the Romans reminded themselves at, at this point in the story. Before long, a mother wolf came along and found the two boys laying down by the river. She laid down with them, kept them warm, protected them, even gave them milk to drink. Until before long, a shepherd arrived and found the two boys lying there with, with this beast. So shepherd and, and his wife adopted them, raised them as their own children, where the two boys who were destined to be kings and founders of a great kingdom grew up as lowly shepherds. Before long, the boys grew into men, and they were strong and powerful, just as Amulius had feared. One day, the boys learned their true identity and decided to liberate their mother and get revenge against Amulius, who had left them for dead as infants. So the two boys organized a group of shepherds from the local countryside to, to follow them. And they march on Amulius' city, Alba Longo, where they heroically slay Amulius and they free their mother and, and then would help their grandfather, Numitor, a good and just man, to claim the throne for himself. Afterwards, they set out to fulfill their destiny, to become great kings of their own kingdom. The kingdom which will one day touch the rising sun and reach beyond the horizon, the Romans told themselves. So together, the two returned to the site where they were abandoned on the banks of the Tiber River, surrounded by seven hills. And it's at this site that they decided to found their city, the heart of their new kingdom. But the two of them couldn't agree which of the seven hills they should start building on. Romulus thought that the centermost hill, the Palatine Hill, made the most sense. The site was more defensible, and it could look out on all the other 
six hills, but Remus thought that the Aventine hill would be better. The Aventine hill was closer to the river, Remus said, which would keep the city supplied with fresh water and provide barges for, for trade would, would have access to the city. So the two reached an impasse. They were both strong. They were both powerful. They were both the sons of a god. They both shared a great destiny, and neither one of them intended to budge. So they decided to leave it in the hands of the gods. They sat down on their own chosen hills, and they waited for the gods to provide them with a sign of which one of the two brothers was right. Well, the first sign came to Remus. He saw six vultures fly up from the Aventine Hill where he sat. And he said, see, look, the gods have given me a sign. These vultures flying up from, from my hill are a sign of the many enemies that my kingdom will defeat on which these vultures will feed. Shortly after, his brother Romulus received his own vision. And he saw 12 vultures fly up from the Palatine Hill where he said, he said, no, 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 hold on a second here. The gods only showed you six vultures, but they showed me 12. Clearly the gods favor my sight and they favor me as the superior man. Now, at first, the two just argued with each other about this. Remus claimed that his was the first vision, and so it was the most important, while Romulus, Romulus claimed that his was the greater vision, which made it more important. But before long, their dispute came to blows. And in the end, Romulus killed his brother Remus and threw him into the river Tiber. And with that, the city of Rome was founded on the Palatine Hill, and Romulus became its first king. I talk about Rome, and I tell stories about the Roman Empire a lot, and there's good reason for that. I mean, yes, I love Roman history. I've been reading Roman history since long before I became a pastor, but, but that's really only a part. You see, I talk about Rome so much because when it comes to our Bible, especially our New Testament letters and, and Gospels and Revelation, when it comes to our heritage and our inheritance as Christians, it's almost impossible to fully understand all of its meaning without fully understanding the world into which it was born a world that was thoroughly dominated by the power and the cultural values of Rome and the Roman people. I talk about Rome because even when the Romans aren't actually mentioned in our Bibles, and the Romans are mentioned a lot in our Bibles, even when they're not mentioned, the entirety of the Christian New Testament was written with the shadow of Rome and the legends of men like Romulus and Remus towering perilously over top of it. Take the story of Romulus, for example. Listen to some of the details again. Tell me if this sounds familiar. An infant child, born to a virgin mother, Hunted by an evil and jealous king, forced into hiding, watched over by animals, raised as a shepherd, and surrounded by shepherds, born to be a king. Now, if that story doesn't sound familiar to you, then I really dropped the ball this Christmas. Because, of course, the legends of men like Romulus and Remus and the nativity stories that early Christians like Luke and Matthew told about Jesus sound an awful lot alike. That's not an accident. 
God was doing something powerful, something earth-shaking in Jesus. God was sending a message to the world and sending a message to places like Rome. In the Tivity story, God and Jesus flip the script on Rome. In a sense, the nativity was God's and the first Christian's way of showing the lie in all these legends that the Romans told themselves about their great destiny and all their incredible power. In the nativity story, we can almost hear the first Christian saying, look here, Rome, we got the real king right here. He's got all the fancy trappings that you tell each other about thugs like Romulus, but our king is real. He is with us and among us. With all your power, all your strength and glory, you couldn't stop him. You nailed him to a cross and he came right back his power and his glory are greater than yours will ever be, because unlike Romulus, Jesus really is the Son of God, the only God. At the risk of being crass, the nativity story is kind of like Rome, is kind of like God, and the first Christian's way of taking the founding legends of Rome and giving them the middle finger. There are a lot of stories like that in our Bibles. And in this morning's scripture, we get just a little clue, a little hint of why that is. Why God and the first Christians, like Paul, felt that it was so important to undermine Roman values and Roman beliefs with the stories that they told. This morning, we hear a passage from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. Now, I talked about the city of Corinth in the past. Corinth was an old city. Even by the standards of the Romans, Corinth was an old city. The Greeks of Corinth had a history that stretched back long before the city of Rome had ever been founded. It was also a rich and a powerful city. In Paul's day, Corinth was a center of trade and culture in the Roman world. Every day, thousands of people came and went on trading ships and caravans in the city of Corinth, which gave the Corinthians a lot of power and influence over the kinds of beliefs and ideas that spread across the Roman Empire on these trade routes. By Paul's day, the city of Corinth was also a thoroughly Roman city. Roman soldiers patrolled its streets. Roman governors and officers administered its laws. Roman coins were exchanged in its markets. We even hear it in the names that Paul uses in this morning's reading. Crispus, Gaius, Stephanus, all Roman, all Latin names. Even the Greek citizens, folks like Apollos or Cephas, would have grown up immersed in the stories and the legends of Rome's greatness and power and Rome's destiny. And the lesson of Rome was simple. For most people, the lesson of Rome would have seemed as irresistible as its armies. Those who have the power Get the glory. Strike first, be strong, and triumph. To the people of Paul's churches, Rome's dominance and control must have seemed absolute. They had the power. They had the soldiers. They had the wealth and resources. And the story of Romulus and his brother Remus made the terms of Rome's dominance clear. Submit to Rome's power. 
bow to Rome's authority and recognize that the gods favored Rome over all other nations or powers, just as the gods had favored Rome's founding father, Romulus. Because the story of Romulus was meant to remind everyone Rome would destroy its own brother rather than yield to anyone else's power. And if they would destroy their own brother, imagine what they would do to you. For the first Christians, the men and women of Paul's churches, for the men and women of Corinth, the cross of Jesus was meant to be a reminder of that power. A reminder of what Rome did to anyone that opposed her. That was Rome's message, at least. But God, as we know, had other plans. Because of course for Rome, and for anyone in any age, still committed to the belief that wealth, that power, and glory, and prestige, that strength, and might make us justified to those throughout history like Rome who have committed themselves to the belief that might makes right. The cross was the end of the story. Jesus died. God huffed and God puffed and Rome kept right on marching. With the Soldiers of Rome surrounding you on all sides. It was an easy lesson to learn. Throughout history, it's continued to be an easy lesson to learn. For every soldier and army that has realized it can trample over a helpless people without even blinking. Right down to the neighborhood bully who learns that he can take cheap shots at the weaker kids in the neighborhood and nobody, including God, is going to stop him. No bolts of lightning are coming to do anything about it. But Paul saw what Rome was trying to do. Paul saw the message that people like Rome were trying to spread. Which is why he reminds the Corinthian church, he says, For the message of God, for the message about the cross, is foolishness to those who are perishing. But for those of us being saved, it is the power of God. The cross is the power of God. Not the sword, not the armies. Not the military, not the treasury. The cross is the power of God. You see, for those who want the power of God and the power of Jesus to look like what power looks like in this world, to look like strength and dominance and absolute authority, the cross really does seem foolish. How do you win by dying? How do you establish a kingdom by sacrificing your king? If the world is a chessboard and the power of this world prevails, if Jesus really is our king, then by the wisdom of this world, God looks like a really bad chess player. But as Paul reminds us, for those being saved, and I love that word here, being saved, not saved, but being saved, because it's a work in progress. Even for the best of us, which is why, no matter how far we fall, there is always hope. We are still being saved. For those of us who have experienced the living presence of Jesus, the cross was just the beginning. Where powers like Rome see the cross as checkmate, Paul reminds us that the cross was just God's opening gambit in a game that is still being played. Even now, even in our darkest and most confusing and most discouraging moments, we are still being saved. 
God is moving. Jesus lives. Love. When it doesn't make any sense to love. Forgive each other. Even when everything inside of you is telling you that you should walk away. Have hope. Even in those times when it seems the most stupid to hope. Take up the cross of Jesus. Because as Paul reminds us, the cross of Jesus is power. By the power of the cross, God wins. By his grace, we win too. Please pray with me this morning. Most gracious God, this morning we ask that you give us hearts to see the power of your Son, Jesus Christ. Give us the courage and the strength to take up his cross, that by that cross we might have our own power in this world. Help us to forsake the power of this world, the power of might, of authority, of control. Instead, give us the power of love, the power of hope, the power of mercy, of humility and forgiveness. Help us to walk where your Son, Jesus Christ, has walked, to follow on his path, that we might always be saved in you. Amen.
9 to 12, Monday through Wednesday. If you have donations, items to, to drop off for the, for the rummage sale, then, then you can do so. Monday through Wednesday, 9 through 12. And then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, the ladies of the church will be here for our rummage sale. Come on up, find good sweaters and all kinds of other fun items, and, and all they ask is, is a donation. You choose your own value, donate as much or as little as you want, and, and take as much and as little as, as you'd, you'd like to take. As I understand, you are also looking for volunteers still as well, right? Is that, is that accurate? Are we good on volunteers? Never. Never. We are never good on volunteers. There's a sign-up sheet on the wall. As you go into the lake room, uh, sign up. Uh, there's there's sign-up sheets for each of the days. You can sign up by hourly or set set slot. So so consider volunteering if you got a little extra time to spend to help out in the rummage sale. Uh, please please consider doing so. Uh, also want to put on everyone's radar two upcoming events. So let, yesterday. We had our first Methodism 101 class, which is really called Methodism 101 because I couldn't think of a better name for it. Uh, really, it's an introduction to what it means to be, be a church. And so about, uh, about eight of us gathered together in my office. We had coffee and tea and pastries, and we had a really nice time. And, and we just talked about our own faith backgrounds. And if you're someone who's ever wondered why we do the things we do in church or why the church works the way it does or why we're Methodists and not Lutherans or Presbyterians and how all of these different things that really don't seem to matter all that much at all, uh, why, why they make such a big deal to, to so many people. We're going to be talking through all of those things and, and many other things, right? If you've ever had any questions, uh, we're, we're pretty free and open and come and talk and and, and we, have, we have a lot of fun. So our next meeting is going to be in two weeks, coming up on February 4th, Saturday, February 4th, in my office at 11.30 a.m. And then afterwards, you can join Barb and Linda and, and other folks who will be gathering in the lake room to make fleece blankets to donate to shelter animals in, in our area. If you'd like to be a part of one or both, of those things, you are welcome to do so. Everyone is welcome. If you're planning to join Barb and Linda for, for fleece blanket tying, please bring your own fleece with you. You can get sheets of fleece from Joanne Fabrics or Michaels. Um, bring, bring some fleece. They'll, they'll talk you through how to make them and tie them. They're super easy. Even a big lug like me can, can make these, these kinds of blankets, and, and they look absolutely fantastic. We've, we've got some of those at home, actually, um, that, that are really popular. So, um, so mark your calendars, and, and please plan to, to come out and join us for one of both, or both of those things, if, if you are able. Any other announcements that I need to know? Anything from United Methodist Women? No? Okay, excellent. Then, my friends, I invite you all to receive this word of blessing. What are you gesturing to me for, hon? Oh, I no noisy offerings. I, I thought this was the last Sunday. Sorry. Oh, I wondered. Okay. Yeah. Carry on. I will. Next Sunday is noisy <laughs> offering. They'll bring your change. <laughs> so I guess that's a helpful reminder. Yeah. Next Sunday will be our noisy offering. Um, in January, we support Lake Fenton Community Schools, the Lake Fenton Community School Foundation. So. So bring any loose change, flip over the couch cushions at home, look, look in every nook and cranny of your car to find that loose change that fell out of your pockets and, and bring it all into church next week, and, and it'll go to support a good cause here. Um, so if there are no other announcements, I invite you all to receive this word of blessing. May you always seek the strength of the cross, the strength of love, of hope, of humility, even when the world tells you that these kinds of things are foolish. May the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you always. My friends, you are deeply loved. I invite you to go forth this morning in peace. <laughs>
Stop our live stream here. <laughs> 